Hello and welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week we've got extra sprockets, aero chain sets, carbon wheels, alloy rims and Paris-Roubaix tech. Yeah, and we are talking just what makes a super bike super. Why a super? Well, I know, but, you know, we're elaborating on that. Oh, OK. Right, what is hot in the world of tech this week? Well, after last week's announcement of the new Shimano 105 group set, this week coming out of Italy, in Campagnolo to be precise, the people who brought us 9, 10 and 11 speed group sets, they've just launched two new 12 speed group sets. They have indeed. Weirdly though, they've only released mechanical versions of the new record and super record group sets. But it's not just about the extra sprocket, Oh no, they've seen a full redesign. Yeah, and let's look first of all at those new rear derailleurs. Check them out. They've got that sort of Shimano style direct mount, haven't they? So in theory, that's meant to give you improved accuracy of shifting as well as tucking away the mech. And apparently it gives you a quicker wheel change too. Yeah. Um, now they've done away also with the necessity of having to have either a short or medium cage rear derailleur. So that's good news, isn't it? You know, less, less yeah. products for bike shops having to stock at least. But I don't know actually on what number of teeth that can accommodate at the rear cassette because Campag, they only make two new cassettes for that. So 1129 and 1132. Yeah, and you will need a new Campagnolo cassette as well. Although, brilliantly, it's got to be said, they've engineered them to fit on your current 11 speed free hub, so you wouldn't necessarily need to buy new wheels. But in order to do that, they've had to make everything thinner. So you have a narrower spacing between the sprockets. The sprockets themselves are narrower. The chain, therefore, has to be narrower. And of course, your shifters have to be brand new to accommodate the change in lever pull. Now, one thing that I think is quite interesting here is that, of course, we already have 12 speed on mountain bikes, courtesy of the SRAM Eagle group set, and they haven't changed the spacing a great deal. So apparently the sprockets are just 0.15 millimeters Not closer much. together. They still fit on an 11 speed free hub, but in order to accommodate it, they've obviously got that massive 50 tooth, yeah, 50 tooth sprocket on the cassette. And because it's so big, it effectively fits over the dishing of the spokes. And those new ergo power levers, well, they actually feature a better level of reach adjustment. So a turn of the screw, you can put them inwards or outwards from your bars, whereas the previous models just had long and extra long reach. So <laughs> don't forget, they've also got an extra click. So oh, they have. So you can, you can now get into that 12th sprocket, whereas before they just had 11 yeah. or and 10. Yeah. Is it 10 clicks for 11 sprockets? It is, yeah. There we go, okay. <laughs> and both disc and rim brake users will be happy too because those new hydraulic calipers that were launched last year, well, they've got some new levers now, haven't they, to go on them? Yeah. But the rim brakes, they've changed because the previous models, they were quite, well, in fact, they were very smooth looking, weren't they? Yeah. Whereas the new record and super record 12 are pretty angular looking, aren't they? Quite futuristic. Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, last couple of new bits, the front derailleur has been redesigned to allow you to run fatter tires without falling foul of the of the swing arm. And then, of course, there's the chain set. Always the most distinctive mm. part of a new group set, isn't it? Yeah. It defines the group set. In this case, they certainly look more aero. The super record one also have a carbon fiber reinforcing plate. So if you put out big power, you should get better shifting. <laughs> But yeah, we don't we don't care. Uh, but then the look, I'm I like it, but I don't love it. If I'm completely right. honest, I'm still in love with old five arm carbon Campagnolo yeah. cranksets from like 2012. I'm still in love with stuff from the 80s, to be honest. Like, <laughs> you know, that hidden bolt away. But do you know what? I love carbon fibre, so I like it, mate. Well, okay. And in that case, you are going to love this next crank set because this, this is some serious carbon porn. Hit me with it. And also, it's going to be more of a game changer, I think, than the Campagnolo one because this is the new 3T Torno Limited crank set. Oh, that is very nice, isn't it? Hubba hubba. And that side is billed as the first, the world's first even, one by aerodynamic chain set. There we go, and game changer. <laughs> and strikingly, one of the first things you notice about that is actually the integrated spider, isn't it? Um, which is then fitted with one of the proprietary wolf tooth components chain rings. And it certainly stands out that, doesn't it? It does. Although, I mean, it doesn't really stand out if we're talking in literal terms. No. Because when you look down at it, you can't see the bolts. It's incredible. And then the cranks don't stand out either, literally. So apparently, the narrowest crank on the market was 15 millimeters. Right. These bad boys come in at 12 millimeters wide. Whoa. Okay, yeah, so super, super slimline, part of the aero-ness. Uh, that means that actually the, uh, 
the thread for the pedals is narrow as well, but also it pulls the whole cranks inboard, so your Q factor is narrower. So that's the distance from the ends of your cranks to each other, so effectively how widely spaced your pedals are. And it's four mil narrower than Durace, which doesn't sound like much, but that's significant, isn't it? Really significant yeah. in bike fit terms. And I mean, in fact, there's a couple of riders who many years ago would have loved that, isn't there? In particular, Graham Obrey, he was obsessed with trying to get that really narrow Q factor, hence the washing machine bottom bracket <laughs> yeah. bearing. And then there was Jan Ulrich, wasn't it? Yeah, custom TT one, bike. Yeah, that Walser TT bike. Your feet will, of course, be more aerodynamic. However, it's not necessarily guaranteed that it's comfortable, so you're going to need to acclimatise that, aren't you? Yeah, you are, yeah. I don't think these 3T cranks have got washing machine bearings, have they? Not that I'm aware No, of. I think they're proper yeah. ones, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I have been lucky enough to use this crank set already, actually, and it's really striking. When you look down at it, you know I'm a fan of one bite, I yeah. think it looks clean. This is outrageously clean. There's just nothing to it. And even apparently if you're riding behind someone with those cranks, it looks like bonkersly clean. It's incredible. Blades of carbon in the air, basically. Well, yeah. A bit and like spinergies. No, not quite as dangerous as spinergies, I don't think. <laughs> they're not literally blades, they're just, you know, they're uh, aerodynamically sculpted. It's mega light, though, isn't it? 400 grams? Something like that. 400 grams with a, with a 40 tooth chain ring. 445 grams, I heard, yeah, with a 40 tooth oh. chain ring. So, yeah, there we go. It's, it's, a, it's a work of art, isn't it, yeah, Frank? Yeah, that is. Anyway, more tech later? Definitely. Following on from the videos that we released at the weekend where we pitched our Canyon Superbike against a mid-range Canyon to see just how they would stack up out on the road, we thought we would tackle the follow-on question, which is just what makes a Superbike super? So basically a quick recap. In terms of quantifiable results, there wasn't a great deal to actually bring away from it, was there? Well, not in terms of difference, no. No, so take for instance the climb, eight minutes in duration, there was only eight seconds difference between the two bikes. And then the braking test, just 70 centimeters. That surprised me. Uh, and then the time trial over a similar duration, there was just 12 seconds difference, wasn't there? Yeah. So on those three tests between a two and a 4% difference, which isn't a lot, especially as a difference is 1,000 pounds and 6,000 pounds. Yeah, but that's undeniably great news because it shows that you do not need to have a super bike in order to be competitive. But understandably, perhaps, in the comment section underneath that video, it certainly raised a lot of questions. Particularly, just what do you get for your extra £5,000 or $7,000 investment? Well, if we look at it and try and actually extrapolate out the data behind it, take, for instance, riding up Alpe d'Huez. The difference is over a minute if you're riding at 3 watts a kilo. And on the flat, it worked out that you would save two and a half minutes over an hour. If you were going to ride at, let's say, 30 kilometers an hour, that would therefore work out as being over one kilometer per hour faster. And it might not sound like much, but personally, I can definitely tell the difference when I'm going even a little bit faster for the same effort. And it's like, I mean, it's literally like having a gentle tailwind or a really good day every day. And to put that minute saved on Alpdwares into context, well, that minute saved is significantly more important than the actual speed would suggest, because when you're going uphill, you're constantly accelerating and decelerating. So that's why a lighter bike always feels nicer when going uphill. Uh, much better, certainly, than a theoretical calculation would suggest. That's right, because literally each time you press on the pedals, the bike is responding fractionally faster, leading to the fact that it feels faster to ride, even if the actual time difference isn't all that significant. Now, you will, of course, notice that we are coming back to the whole feel of a bike, but ultimately, I think that is what it comes down to, isn't it? Lightweight or aero superbikes just feel faster and more responsive to ride, but, and I think that's a totally legitimate reason. Yeah, I've been trying to think of an analogy, actually, Si. Oh, yeah. One. Yeah. And I think it's a bit like cars. So you can buy a medium-priced car that is going to meet all the safety certifications, that kind of thing. It's going to get you somewhere in comfort. You know, you're going to be not too hot, not too cold, that kind of thing. Whereas an expensive car is more likely, I imagine, to go a lot faster, even if you can never drive it anywhere yep. close to the speed limit. But... Driving it itself, it's going to be a nicer experience, even when you're sat in traffic, I imagine. I don't know. I don't have a very flashy car. But I guess that all depends really on your passion for driving and also your disposable income, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, really? as to whether you can justify it in the first place. Exactly. It's got to be said though, John, super bikes are better than super cars because a super bike 
is better at just general riding, whereas a supercar might not even be able to get over a speed bump or fit into a parking space. <laughs> Very true. So invest your money in bikes and you're a winner. Very true. I've got to agree with you on that. Yeah, go on. Seriously, though, where do you sit in this whole superbike realm? And what's your feeling about it? Wow. Well, there's a phrase, horses for courses. I don't ride a horse before anyone thinks. Uh, but... I do believe in it. Uh, take for instance, I do have an old steel bike. It does have top of the range components on it, but it's not, I wouldn't say it was a super bike. Um, so on a nice day, I'll go out and ride it and everything like that. Only when the conditions I really do suit it. But if I put a nice pair of wheels on it, carbon wheels, it feels just a little bit faster and everything, but it still doesn't feel super. The reason being it's heavy and that makes a big, big difference. Whereas on the flip side, when I ride, I'm fortunate enough to have a superbike, what I believe is anyway, when I put a leg over that straight away, I feel fast. And you do feel, you know, 2K an hour faster, I reckon, compared to that steel bike. Um, knowing that I'm on a bike, you know, full carbon bike, fully electronic, there's no motor. Um, and yeah, straight away, I just feel ready for it. And I that just makes me feel great when I go out riding. So actually having a super bike makes you feel better even before you've ridden it, just knowing yeah. that you've got the best. Yeah, I think it's a mental thing. I think for me, cycling is a great deal of, of the, the actual mental processes of it all. Knowing that you've got the best there, then the rest is up to your body yeah. rather than the other way around. Interesting, because I, I kind of disagree a little bit here. So, although I love riding a super bike, I don't think you need a super bike to get super bike feel. So for example, my cyclocross bike, aluminium Trek Crockett, uh, is more expensive than our mid-range bike, but it's not top of the range, apart from the wheels, they are. Uh, and then the GCN hand-built bike, you know, it weighs quite a lot more than a carbon road bike, but it feels fantastic, I think. The geometry's spot on, it feels great. And even though I know, a bit like your steel bike, that I'm a K and a half hour slower than I am on my Canyon Air Road, it's still a great bike. I will say though that while you may not need to spend superbike money to get superbike feel, that I do think you need to spend more than our mid-range bike and have a posh set of carbon wheels to get that feel. Mm. And then I think the feel is significantly different enough to totally justify that investment, if of course you can't afford it in the first place. Yeah, It's funny that we both say carbon wheels makes the big difference. Yeah, well, it, and it's, it's huge. It's, it's a long-standing it's, tradition, it is isn't it? Huge. Upgrade your wheels. Yeah and it's the best upgrade you can make. And maybe that still holds true, actually. Anyway, please let us know what you think about all of this. How does the feel of your bike relate to the price that you spent on it? What is justifiable and what is not? Please get involved in the comment section down below. Right, so we've had some great comments underneath last week's video on can you make money from buying and selling bikes. Yeah, well, before we get into the whole issue of buying and selling, one of the things we talked about was the amazing Conago Futura yeah. paint jobs, uh, of which one is on eBay for $110,000. Anyway, Tim Smith got involved to say there's a guy in Adelaide, South Australia, with a Conago Futura bike that he used to ride to the cafe that he worked at. How cool is that? The cafe. Not only has he got a work of art, he uses it as well. Now that. That's, that's true yeah, art, that's John. that's amazing. Now, funnily enough, I've actually been to Adelaide a couple of times for the Tour Down Under, and I've never seen so many bling bicycles really? in one place in my life. Yeah, I've seen Pelotons ride past that must have been worth a million dollars, and that Peloton <laughs> probably only had about 30 riders in it. That's how expensive <laughs> their bikes were. The... Blingest people in Australia seems to just descend to Adelaide for that week. Incredible. Well, there we go. Maybe our Australian uh, viewers can let us know. Is, is Adelaide the most bling place in Australia? Uh, right. What about can you make money? Well, we've got some good news. Joe Wynn, for example, uh, I bought a 1989 Le Monde World Championship TVT92 Greg Sign Limited Edition for 500 bucks and sold it for $3,000 just this year. Oh, and that $3,000 was just for the frame. He kept all of the parts. So there we go. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Big Foz, uh, make money on a bike. They bought a Conago Master on eBay for 500 pounds, sold the Dual Group set and wheels for 450, rode the bike with Campag kit from a box on it for 10 years, uh, sold the frame and forks for 450 pounds. It was one size too small. So in 10 years use, and 400 pounds profit. That, that's the dream, John. That is literally what we yeah. talked about, wasn't it? That the is master. the dream. Oh, you ride a bike oh. and then sell it for a profit. It can be done. Last one here, we got James Butler. I found vintage campy super record down tube shifters in a box of rusty bike parts oh, yes. at a car boot sale. I bought them for 50p and I sold them for 35 quid. Ka-ching indeed. That yeah. is seriously cool. So definitely, 
there is a way of actually making your bike habit pay. Yeah. We need a video, John. We do. We need to go exploring some of these jumble sales. We need to make some money. <laughs> yeah. Paris Bay is sadly done and dusted for another year. But before we get to the point where we can't really talk about it anymore, let's have a quick look at the tech, yeah. shall we? Firstly, we can see here, as Denex Stebar opted for those cross top brake levers that allows him to actually slow down when he's riding on the tops. And then you can see Mike Turnison is riding a giant Defy Advanced SL, but a team edition one. So that means there's a shorter head tube on there so he can get his racy position, unlike the ones that you buy in the shops, which are much more upright, basically. Uh, but he still gets the benefit, of course, from the slightly more relaxed, stable geometry and the greater tire clearance. Exactly the same, in fact, as Trek find with their Damani Race Shop Limited, and indeed the Specialized that race at Roubaix. Well, more on those in just a second. Mm. And sticking with frames, so four riders from Azure Desire Le Mondial actually took to the start line on a special collaboration called One More Lap, and that was with clothing brand Chapter 3. So if you look closely there, you can see red, black, and blue lines painted on the seat tube, and they're to represent the measuring line, the sprinter's line, and the stayer's line that you find on a velodrome. And of course, as everyone knows, Paris-Roubaix finishes on a velodrome. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I do love a bit of custom paint. You know, the factors always look great, but custom, it just draws you in that little bit more than it. Like, in fact, the Sylvain Dillier's red factor. We all, we all know <laughs> yeah. that red bikes are faster, Much and fun. we saw a lot of his bike, given that he was in the brake for, what, 200 kilometers? Yeah, we saw it all day, in fact. Interestingly, too, that Paris Roubaix was actually one on board a custom bike, and not well, just go. the paintwork, because Peter Sagan was using a specialized S-Works Roubaix with direct mount brakes. And the version that you or I could buy is only available with disc brakes. So there we are, something there. Also, if you look there, his rear derailleur, which is mechanical instead of electronic, is actually attached using a direct mount hanger. Looks pretty custom, not seen those before. Yeah, and I bet that frame is entirely custom yeah. for the quick step and the poor guys, purely, again, coming down to the geometry. Mm. There's no way they could get comfy on the stack height of a normal off no. the shelf Rube bike. No, not at all. But the Future Shock as well, that was also customized. Yeah. So that's the little suspension unit that is up front on those bikes. Rather than suspending the bike, they've suspended the handlebars and steps. You've got 20 mil of travel on there apparently, but the team edition is you've got a lockout on there. So they could literally turn it on or off depending on whether they were on cobbles or roads. Quite trick that. Now from race tech to tech that you can buy, and eyewear giants Oakley, who we mentioned last week during the Wall of Fame, have just released two new pairs of sunglasses the field jackets and the flight jackets. Yeah, the flight jackets, let's start with them. They definitely stand out, don't they? Because there is no top section to the frame. And you know what, John? It kind of reminds me of Dennis Taylor's snooker glasses. There's probably about 15 of you out there that will know what I'm talking about. But if you do know, see? Yeah, once seen, can't unsee. <laughs> He's a snooker legend, that man. Anyway, it's the same principle. So imagine yeah. yourself on the drops. Go on. Okay. Get an arrow. Yeah. Now trying to look up. Right, and you've yeah. got that traditional sunglass uh, top frame, haven't you, obscuring your vision? Well, no I might do, yeah. yeah. No, it's Not cool. Uh, perhaps the big tech news, though, is actually what's called the advancer toggle. So it's like a little switch on the nose piece that means that when you're going slowly, you've got quite a bit of heat build up. Instead of the lens fogging up, you switch them, it moves the lens further away from your face to allow for more airflow and therefore stop foggy lenses. Pretty cool. That does sound cool. But Doesn't I reckon I can trump you with something there. Really? Because they've got now different length temples coming in with the glasses. So essentially removing the possibility of any interference with a helmet retention or fitting system. So I've always fallen victim to that in the past, actually. I want to have the side of the glasses touching my head and not the helmet. Yeah. In the past, I've had to use a Dremel to actually shorten mine. <laughs> Crikey, good effort, mate. Uh, now, the field jackets, meanwhile, uh, do look significantly different, don't they? Much softer, less angular shape. And they've also got two lenses as opposed to just one. Which would you go for? I'd go for the Dennis Taylors, I think. Definitely the uh, the flight jackets. Snooker. Yeah, Loves they're it. pretty cool, aren't they? Loves it. Over onto wheels now, and Knight Composites have just launched some TLA wheels. What does that stand for? Tubeless Aero, which apparently are the first truly road tubeless Easy setup tire system. John, I think they might have missed the boat on that particular marketing claim. I mean, we saw last year, didn't we, when Mavic launched their tubeless system oh, yeah. that they did everything that Knight now claimed that they can do. But anyway, marketing claims aside, it's still a good thing. Uh, Knight have been working closely with Schwalbe to deliver what they say apparently is a system that means you don't need tire levers and you can also inflate them with just a mini pump. 
So that is Why cool, not? isn't it? Because it means that if you do get a puncture with your tubeless wheels and you're out stuck in the middle of nowhere, you're not going to end up in a position where you can't get your tyre off, which is a problem with some setups. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Now, weight-wise, they're coming in at 1,430 grams, and that's built on 35 mil rims and rotors revolver hubs. Pretty like that. Yeah, and then for 35 grams extra, you get some uh, disc brake hubs from DT Swiss. It actually seems like we're finally getting somewhere with road tubeless, doesn't it? Well, it does, and you say that, actually, because we've got some new tyres as well oh. to tell you about. Uh, Goodyear, more commonly known, I guess, for their car tyres, are just releasing a new performance bike tyre line 120 years after their first product, which was, John? A bike tyre. There we go. Back yeah. in the game. Yeah. So perhaps the most interesting ones for us are the Eagle All Season, which is like a road tyre, as we said, tubeless. And then they've also got a gravel tyre called the County and Connector. Now, it's interesting that basically a company has come back into the tyre game and has gone full bore, basically, launching tubeless tyres. Um, I mean, I guess they've seen a bit of a gap in the market there, and they want to try and exploit it, perhaps, try and get their market share. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I don't think there is a gap in the market, but if they perform well, then they'll be well received, won't they? Yeah. And if, crucially, the bead seat diameter is consistent <laughs> and non-stretchy, and then, you know, because that's what's made yeah. a difference when it comes to actually inflating them easily and getting mm -hmm. them on easily. That is the crucial part. Anyway, before we leave New Tech this week, we've got to give a bit of a shout out to the new Fuji. So this is a new women-specific aero bike. They say they've tweaked the geometry to make it fit female riders better. But the big news is the fact that it's actually over a minute faster, over 40 kilometers, than their current aero bike, than their men's aero bike, which is wow. amazing, isn't it? That's a lot faster. That's a big amount of time to save. Yeah. Especially over 40K. Well done. Yeah, anyway, so that is the Fuji Supreme 1.0. Yeah. Very nice. More tech next week. It's now time to induct another product into the Hall of Fame. Oh. Last week, we brought you the Oakley Factory Pilot. We did. Certainly a head turner. And this week, it's a lost icon of Paris Roubaix, the Ambrosio Nemesis Rim. Ah, oh, an absolute classic. Now, for many of you, the sight of carbon wheels in the Cobble Classics is just going to be absolutely normal. But for others of you, it's still going to seem like a relatively modern introduction. And that's because. Until very recently, aluminium box section wheels were the king of Paris-Roubaix, and in fact, the Ambrosio Nemesis was the king of kings. Uh, there was, of course, the Mavic Paris-Roubaix SSC that was pretty popular, wasn't mm. it? But then that was discontinued, and the Nemesis rim took over. Yeah, the bomb-proof Nemesis rim, I've got to call it that, was certainly a fitting replacement during the 90s and the noughties, really. Uh, so essentially, a tubular box section rim, normally fitted with 36 spokes, tied and soldered. Naturally. A little bit of extra strength, and a telltale brass weight around the valve. Do you remember that? So no it's matter- no idea what it was doing there, <laughs> but yeah, I remember. So no, ma no matter how hard a team tried to cover up that they were using them, putting all sorts of other wheel manufacturers on them, you still knew from a mile away that they were the Ambrosio Nemesis rims. Yeah, now unfortunately for the Nemesis, since 2010 and the introduction and the improvement of carbon fiber wheel manufacture, you gotta say, we haven't seen a Paris Bay one on a pair of Nemesis rims. And for a number of years, you did at least see them on team cars, but now there is zero chance of a Paris Bay victory on Nemesis rims because there are no Nemesis rims at all at Paris Bay anymore on team cars or with helpers or no. nothing, which is pretty sad, isn't it? It really? is, yeah. But although, Actually, not so sad. Ambrosio still make them, so you could buy them and look cool. I've got a pair. I don't look cool. But anyway, let us know what tech you want to see in the Wall of Fame in the comments section down below. Bike of the week time. And last week, we put together the two winning bikes of the Tour of Flanders. So we had a specialized S-Works SL6 Tarmac rim brake with Shimano up against a specialized S-Works Tarmac disc brake bike with SRAM Red ETAC. The results are better be good, John, because it's taking you a long time to get through those it's, bike names. It's such a mouthful. Why don't they just call them something else? Anyway, I've been busy counting the votes, as oh. ever, and the winning bike with 75% of the votes was the specialised... Go on. Uh, got you then. Disc brake of Bowles Dolman's. Really? Yeah. Wow. 
That's cool, isn't it? It's and huge. What, that's like a landslide victory yeah, as well, isn't it? Because like special, uh, quick step in their wolf pack is such a big old yeah yeah. Fan anyway, base. that's great. Oh, I'm really pleased about that. Yeah. Right. Anyway, get ready to vote because this week's bike choices are coming up. In the blue corner, we've got the Steven Zenon of World Cyclocross Champ Wout Van Aert, and that's three times Cyclocross Champ, not two times. It's, don't listen to me, I'll try and take that. Uh, anyway, it's got a SRAM ETAP group on there, Zip 303 wheels, 30 mil tires on there, and it's even got cobbles painted on it, and his own face on the head tube. Yes, not since Eddie Merckx, apparently, according to the comment section, have we seen a rider with his face on the head tube. But there we go, he's won three cyclocross world champs, he can do what he likes. Uh, then, in the slightly lighter blue corner, we have got this. It's the KTM Revelator Sky DMP of Team Delco Marseille-Provence. Uh, it too has a SRAM group set on there. Corimer wheels, but disc brakes. So there we go, two slightly left field choices coming from John this week, but get involved in the comments section and vote now. Right, it's time for the Bike Vault where you send in your bikes for us to either rate nice or super nice. So no. I'm back with the horn. No, I've got no, the no, horn. No, no, I've no, 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 no. Put that away, John. What? Right, you've been going in my bin. I have. You tried to hide this from me. Basically, one viewer was so upset at the crapness of that electric it's horn that crap. they were moved to send in a replacement. This is a genuine Swiss cowbell. I'm so excited, and you tried to hide it, but I've gone through your bin I and fished it out. So this. here we go. Oh, there you go. That's like an iconic sound of bike racing, isn't it? So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever you are, in seriousness, thank you. Because, oh yeah, you didn't, you didn't, uh, you didn't put, put your name, your name on the letter. No, but I mean, inside they have a warm, fuzzy glow that the viewers yeah. will be, uh, will, everyone will be like, oh, thank God we don't have to listen to that ridiculous piece of Looks crap. Looks like I'll hang it up here then. No, honestly, mate, you can throw it in the bin. I don't think we I, need that I just, again. I, I will, I'll just place it there for the moment. All right, come on, anyway, let's right, crack on okay, with Okay, right. First up, Alfonso Ramos of Rio de Janeiro. Now, this is a Caloi. Now, do you know about Caloi? Uh, well, no history. I know what they okay, are. I know. Right. Can't hit me with well, it. Well, they had some sort of collaboration with Eddie Merckx around the early to mid '90s. I can't honestly remember right now what it was, but I do remember seeing some world-class riders using Calloy bikes back in the day. Sean Yates, I'm pretty sure, did. Maybe even Lance Armstrong. So there we go. yeah, there we are. A little bit of history there. Nice. I tell you what, mate. I'm yeah. liking this what a very backdrop. much. Yeah, yeah. Cracking back to Rio de Janeiro. Horizontal. The bike itself looks mega. Yeah. The 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 structure is fantastic there, isn't it? Yeah. Cranks at the right position. I can't actually see from this distance. What's he got on there, mate? He's got, it looks like Altegra or one, uh, Altegra or one of I'd say Altegra, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't really see. Neither of us have got our glasses on, have we? No. So, but. I like the matching uh, decals from the wheels and the frame. Yeah. Nice color yeah, scheme. Exactly, yeah, it's like. Green. Very neat saddle yeah, bag. Exactly Bonus balls. points. John, yes. I'm itching. Go on then. Ring the bell. Super nice. Super nice. There we go. So tempting. No, no don't, don't do that. Okay, <laughs> next up, Danny Parker of Maryland Ooh, in the look USA. At that. This is your sort of style of bike, I reckon. Well, yeah, I noticed he's bought some one by, hasn't he? Because that's Shimano on there. Yeah. That's kind of cool, you know. I'm slightly yeah. concerned that it doesn't look like a narrow, wide chain ring, which you really, really need if you're going to try and even bodge one by. Yeah. Uh, but it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. I, lo I love the saddle and bar tape matching. Yeah. That stem's pretty rude, isn't it? Yeah. With a negative like, 17. Got to be 17, that. Saddle's quite a long way forward. It is. It's, it's actually dangerously is it? far forward on the rails, I would say. Yeah, look at it. I don't know. But. You're hesitating, John. Yeah, well, why the hesitation, John? Well, just because of the risk of that saddle not. not he being can't safe. get a super nice because there's potentially a safety risk. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, because it looks like it's quite a you know a tall rider. Danny, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's it's a nice. Well, it's from still us. a nice bike though, isn't it? That? It's a really nice. Really yeah. Nice bike. Get yourself a narrow wide chainring. Slam that saddle back. <laughs> there we go. Great effort. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, Very yeah, nice. nice right. One, What's next, mate? Right. It's Keith. <laughs> well, it's, it's a Keith. Keith. It's Gregoire uh, Jacob or Jacob, and that's Mont Blanc in the background side. It's a Keith. Now, if you've uh, you've had to have been uh, with GCM for a while now, but over at the Taiwan, um, not KOM Challenge, we'd be pleased to hear, but the Taiwan show, uh, we discovered Keith. 
Yeah. And we could never find out who Keith was. But anyway, Keith bikes. Yeah. That's a good looking bike. It isn't is it? a good looking bike. I've, the first time I've ever seen one outside of your video. Yeah, right? me too. And not, I've never seen Keith in the wild before. Yeah. Now, what's going to really upset me, John, is because I love it. I love the bike. I really love the backdrop. But the steerer tube needs a trim. Yeah, it does. It does. Aesthetically. That also can be a little bit dangerous, by the way. So yeah. do make sure you don't have too much steerer tube yeah. hanging at the top on a carbon steerer. Uh, Oh man, that really upsets me because that's I'm absolutely torn. It's a super nice in every respect, other than the steerer tube. But they've got a fancy chain set, fancy chain rings, gold chain. Ah, oh, Gregoire, I'm yeah. so sorry, mate. Yeah, it's got me. Got... Go to your local bike shop, saw off that little bit of steerer tube, come back to us, got and then here. we will ring one of our bells. Uh, depending on who is here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or Gregoire, pop along to the GCN workshop. Look. Oh yeah, got a carbon blade in there yeah, already. Yeah, Bonus. Sort that out for you. So it's oh, a nice bike. Man, really such a nice shame, bike. Because that is cool. Yeah. Right. Right. Whoa. Here we go. Nick Look Horvath. At that. And this is his, this is his giant, and he's from Sydney in Australia. Let's call that the Gothic submission. That's pretty dark, isn't it? I'm liking it is, that yeah. very much. Yeah. And I mean, just to find a bird that size, that's a that's a feat in itself, isn't it? Look at the size um, of it. Oh, no, I don't say anything, Simon. Don't say anything, Simon. Uh, right. No. Let's look at the bike, shall we? Let's look at the bike. A giant TCR Advanced is that? Yeah. What have we got on there? Shimano Ultegra Shimano looks Tegra, pretty yeah. rude. Fulcrums. It looks so cool. Yeah. Next to the giant bird as well, doesn't yeah. it? Matching bottles. Very cool. Yeah. Neat little saddle bag. It's a bike to be used. Nice saddle exactly, to bar drop. Yeah. That's pleasing. Wow. John, it's a super nice from me, mate. It's a super nice from me. There we Bam. go. Oh, so down my right, Stephen Bailey, Lancashire in the UK. He sent in his Scott Addict. Now this has been tuned. Yeah. Five and a half kilos. He said it was. Wow, those wheels Mad are fiber. pretty bling, aren't they? Mad they look. Yeah. Fair play for taking it on a beach as well. Yeah. I hope you carried it on as opposed to you know riding it yeah. through salty sand. But that's very cool. That SRAM red group set, that's a classic, isn't it? Yeah. Is that a gold chain? It's only got gold cables yeah, on there. It's got gold, it's got gold chainring bolts, gold, gold cables, seat like mask. Gold, yeah. A lot of love has gone into that bike, yeah. hasn't it? That is that's super cool. John, is it super nice? Yeah, it's super nice. It's super nice, mate. Yeah. Absolutely lovely. Also, a bit of a bonus, uh, it's a photo taken in England and it's not raining. <laughs> super nice for that. It's probably photoshopped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, remember, no, it happened last year once, I remembered. <laughs> oh yeah, distant memory then. Yeah. Now remember to submit your photos of your bike to the Bike Vault using the email address on screen right now and include where you come from so we can give you a shout out. Absolutely, and if we haven't talked about your bike yet on the show, then please don't give up hope. Send it in again and one day we will get around to it for sure. We'll ring that bell. Or that bell, if I'm not here. Right, that's it. We're nearly at the end of the show, but what's coming up this week? Well, on Saturday, I take a look at the time trial training bike of Nathan Haas. That's pretty cool, isn't it? What's that, yeah. Canyon Speedmax? It is, yeah. I tell you what, I'm quite interested to know what someone trains on for a TT yeah, bike. I would always try and avoid it. Well, it's got, it's got to be done, isn't it? It's yeah, got to be done. Yeah. Uh, he's not even a renowned tester either, is he? No. So, uh, anyway, very interesting. I can't <laughs> wait for that, John. Uh, right, Sunday, we've got another unboxing. This mm. time, it is the Super Bling Fabric ALM Saddles. That's going to be cool. Uh, and then, our Monday's maintenance. John, I believe you are tuning brakes in five minutes. I am, yeah. So, get your stopwatch on and time me. And then, on Wednesday, I'll be back in the tech clinic answering your technical problems, queries, and questions. Yeah, if you can't wait that long, though, then then why not check out some more videos? In fact, we talked about the mid-range versus superbike, of course. If you haven't seen either of those yet, then why not click down there and down there?